once you go along with deferring to authority, you're in big trouble because they do not have your best interest in mind. They can do a lot of harm, and they do. Much more harm has been done by public health than by any number of doctors. A doctor may be incompetent, may make mistakes, but how many people will they harm? Very few. But public health, with one swoop policy, you can kill hundreds of thousands. But I do remember things. You see, what I remember is, first of all, being demonized as we were spreaders of disease. That's what the Nazis called the Jews. They put a great deal of fear through propaganda. You know, it's funny, the New York Times, that's what they're saying the evangelical Christians are because they refuse to get the vaccine. I find an interesting parallel there. We're not going to go down that there path. There are plenty of paths. But, so but you really remember is, this? Oh, I remember. Look, I think that mostly people don't give children a lot of credit. Children absorb a great deal. They hear the adults talk. They sense the fear, because there was always fear in those three years that I was in the camp. The fear was to be, for me to be separated from my mother after I had lost my father to, did, a, to an infectious disease, t uh, typhus, typhus. So many people died of typhus Absolutely. in those camps. Yes. Um, I know I've read the experiences of uh, Corey Ten Boom in, in um, I forget where she was, which camp. The, the one where all the women were. Uh, it'll come to me later. It doesn't matter. Uh, um, t yes, Ravensbrook. Ravensbrook. So, uh, so your father died in the camp. Yes. Soon after. I think it was probably half a year after. Uh, Did you have siblings? The reason, no. The reason typhus was so prevalent is because of the conditions. Overcrowding and, and no hygiene. Absolutely filthy. So... Uh, and that spread through lice. And so Himmler compared Jews to lice. Yeah. He said it was, this is not about ideology, this is not about, this is about health. Health. Isn't that interesting? There's certain things you can use as a bludgeon. Yes. Health is classic. You're seeing it now with COVID. The specter of death trumps everything and That's people right. say i don't want you to say one word because these are, lives are at stake and you think ultimately when are lives not at stake they're at stake in every decision we make and we of have course. to have some some clarity but so okay you remember being there your father died must have been very traumatic so you're you're a little girl with your mother in a nazi concentration camp what can you tell us about that um hunger the pain of hunger because that's what this camp was essentially. It was to starve. And from time to time, they would take men for slave labor. Some came back, some didn't. It was, as I said, fear was always hovering over. Death was hovering over us. Uh, I was rescued uh, along with a couple of hundred orphan children. My mother lied to get me out, to save me. And this was in 44. By then, it was the final solution was in full swing. And they were going to liquidate all the camps. Now, for people that don't know, I mean, it's an amazing thing to think that the final solution of killing all the Jews didn't happen until fairly late. That's people right. think that it happened right away, and they think that in the 1935, this is going on. Absolutely not. No. This did not happen until halfway through, more than halfway through the That's war, right. That's right. that they make this decision. That's right. Um, so when I left, when I was rescued, I left in one of those cattle cars that were the ones that shipped everyone to concentration camps. And you were six or seven? Uh, yes, yeah, six. And um, then... It, we had to have someone in Romania. We were as if returned to Romania, and Romania was a pretty corrupt regime, as all are, but their p money m could buy you life. So essentially, we, our lives were bartered for money to 
uh, the Romanian head of state. And so then I had an odyssey of about 10 months en route to Palestine. Now, the I've state. never known this. First of all, the idea that Jews in concentration camps could potentially get out. As, as a little girl, you got out through some, I mean, it's a, it's a bizarre thing. I've never heard of that. It's, yeah, I'm not totally sure which organizations, you know, got together and paid the ransom, but it was organized, not from the camp, yeah. from abroad. But it's just an amazing Remember, they, thing. It, it, Hitler always needed money. I mean, this is, <laughs> so there are, were things that were done. There were. Yeah. Uh, very few, obviously. And this was sort of, I, in a sense, I could say it's miraculous. But I, it's something that I'm trying to convey to people to understand that they need to trust their own instinct, their own human, whatever they have. And that's what's being destroyed now as it was then, you know. After all, when we were chased out and thrown out, you know, my father, my mother, they couldn't do anything. It's the most horrific thing when parents realize they can't protect their child, never mind themselves. There's nothing worse. It's evil, I mean, let's face it. It's exactly, I learned, really, I know what evil is. Well, there are a lot and, of people that don't believe in evil. Well, you which see, is fascinating, isn't it? You know, I've thought about it, and I believe that one of the reasons that they throw at us, oh, conspiracy theories, is partly, of course, the politicians and those who are doing, who are running the show, know exactly. But other people, they seem to really be unable to imagine evil because they're not really evil. Right. Very few people are evil. But because they have others simply following along, they can do so much worse. Alone they couldn't do it. So that the other people, the functionaries, and those who go along to get along, that's the worst betrayal really of us, of humanity. Well, that's but that's why we are here, right? In other words, whether you're talking about Hannah Arendt or you're talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, "Silence in the face of evil is itself evil." Yes. So the idea, we don't know if he actually said it, but this is attributed to him. But the point is that if you do not speak up, if you go along with the crowd, you are complicit, absolutely, in evil. Yes. And we're we're seeing this now. I still want to finish your story, but I want to, of course, get back to the parallels of what you see today. But Let's, let's continue with your story. You, so you're making your way alone to Palestine, mm -hmm. age seven. Where does that go? What happens? Well, when my mother sent me, she had sewn into the seams of my coat every name, every person that she could possibly think of all over the world, wherever I would land that there should be some. And she had a sister in Palestine. Wow. And so I, the family, I, the families kept me with them until they located my aunt who came and picked me up. Again, they were strangers. They had some, well, they had jewelry. They had, again, sewn into, you know, what in the scenes. Were they Jewish also? Yeah. Yeah. And where had they come from? That's an amazing I don't know. thing. You don't I, know. Yeah, I don't know, really. They, well, I think what it was that, as I said, in Romania, Jews were able to buy their way yes, for yes. a while. Right. And then that while ended. Right. And so then they used the money to, and perhaps those who were wealthy that way, in part financed for the children as well. You see, it was yeah. a, it might have been a piggyback kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Probably. But anyway, okay, so I was with them for, in Israel by then uh, for about two weeks, and then my aunt came and got me. And my aunt and uncle and their two sons lived on a farm, what you would call today an organic farm. I was with them for three years. It was the happiest part of my childhood. This is where I healed. Uh, because 
I fit in exactly between one, one boy, my cousin, was three years older and the other one younger, and I fit right in. And at that time also, uh, Israel was a very, very um, egalitarian kind of country, really. Nobody was wealthy and nobody was really very poor. Of course, it, immigrants, when they came, they had to, until they could find them housing and all that, but it was still, you know, the British were <laughs> still there. But the people were very, very um, welcoming. Now, did your mother ever make her way? My mother, okay, no. My mother made her way to the United States. She decided, no, she's not going to Israel because she didn't want to be again in a war zone. She realized that war is, going, is approaching, and she didn't want that. So she wound up coming to the United States. <laughs> and, wow. and I've seen all the changes, you know, <laughs> the good and the bad. And right now we're in the horror zone. Well, this is, I, I want to talk to you about all that, but I'm just fascinated with your story, and it's just important since we have the time to hear your story. It's a beautiful story, even maybe perhaps because there's such difficulty in the middle of it. But you, um, so you're, you're a very young woman. You, you're with your mother. Um, where do you go from there? Did you go to right away into the public schools? Yes. Well, I did. <laughs> We tried for, I don't know, less than, a, less than a month in a yeshiva, a Jewish religious school, but I didn't like that at all. <laughs> uh, so, no, because in Israel, uh, the schools, there were actually, you know, progressive schools and all that kind of thing. But of course, it was very, very different than here. One of the things that got lost in the shuffle with new education and all that, you know what, in Israel, during the summer vacation, we had workbooks for each subject. And we sat down at around 10 o'clock with a few other children, I was three others, you know, after having an orange and bananas, things that are in Israel, and we do our homework, we'd every, you know. And so when you came back in September, you didn't forget. That was such a positive thing to do. Mm. Here, you think of summer break as, you know, let it yeah. all out. It, it's just, anyway, but as you can see, the culture was so different there than here. Yeah. So then I went to public schools, yeah. In Manhattan? Yeah. Uh, are, are any of the schools still around? Yeah, I mean, I know my junior high school, Joan of Arc, is still around. Yeah. <laughs> it, that was, yeah, that... There, you know, they, again, that was progressive, so we had uh, special, I was in the special writing class, the special this, that, you know, it was, uh, what I hated was actually high school. Where'd you go to high school? George Washington High School. Where, where? In Washington Heights. Way I think, up. I think that's where Henry Kissinger that's grew That's what up. I was just going to say, and you know, that doesn't make me any happier either. <laughs> But it's interesting to think all of these ethnic enclaves. Yes. I know there's a lot of Greeks up there. There's, it's just funny how there's different, you know, there were a, different. Lot of, a lot of uh, Dominicans, you know, different areas yes. become different. I grew up in Jackson Heights, which was totally Jewish uh -huh. until we moved to Connecticut and suddenly it became Colombians. Wasp. and, and all, yeah. No, no. It would, but it's just so fascinating. So you're in Washington Heights. You didn't like, why didn't you like George Washington High School? Because it was so anonymous. It was big. Oh, and just hated it. And, you know, I mean, I remember at that time, um, they would come to give cigarettes outside, you know, the, the, the luring children to become addicted and things like that were so, already so, happening. Because I want to talk to you, of course, about you're seeing these parallels between where we are today uh, and some of the things you experienced as a child. What, what launched you on the tra trajectory? When did you uh, get into the professional stuff? When did you get married? How did that happen? Uh, when I was 18, I went on a year's seminar in, to Israel, uh, a leadership seminar. And I met what would be my future husband, but, but that, he was a reporter and he was a, uh, a law school uh, student. And there, I, for half a year, I lived on a kibbutz. <laughs> so I learned what that was like, and I realized that, yeah, very nice, except 
that's not what I would. You're not going to live there. So you're in a no. kibbutz. This is, the, this is the late fifties. Yeah, I knew that I would not want to be ordered where I could work, when I could do this, that, and the other things. You know, being independent. And then I came back and uh, finished college. Um, and my husband came to the United States, and then we remet, and then that was kind of it, and we married. Uh, we had what year did you marry? 57. 57? December bride. <laughs> oh, wow. I was young, really, but December bride. Yeah. We were married for 62 years. So you were, you were uh, what, 20 years old? And you were married for 62 years. Your husband passed away a year ago. Yeah, but not he was he, from not COVID, COVID. Not COVID. Not COVID. Not COVID. No. But they want, did they want to mark it down as COVID? Yes, they did. The doctor told me, I have to. I said, no, you won't. I'll fight it. <laughs> he said, I have to? I have to, yes. Why? Because he was ordered to. But why? I mean, wh your yes. husband did not die of COVID, so he's ordered Correct. to lie by yes. somebody? By who? Yes, well, it's orders were given. Orders were given by the government to hospitals to do that, and they did. I mean, we had, for a long time, so many deaths. And what happened to the deaths from pneumonia? What happened to the deaths from the flu? Every year we have lots of people die from the flu. Not all, it was all marked as COVID. Yeah. I they, mean, we've jumped ahead 62 years, but that's okay because uh, we're, we're going to go back. But your husband died from what? He actually, he was sick for a long time. He had dementia. And he was in an assisted living home, which was very good, unlike the nursing homes that you read about. He really he got weaker and weaker, and he really, really got weak. And I think, of course, three weeks we were separated because of the lockdown. That, that kind of finished it, but I was with him But people aren't talking days. about how the lockdown is killing people. It is horrific. Yes, it's, it's horrific what they're doing. I mean, okay, one of the, par one of the important parallels that I have is between the nursing home slaughter all over Western Europe and the United States by order of government. And a project in Nazi Germany, T4, those two are pretty much identical. I've, I've written about T4, so I'm familiar with it, but a lot of people wouldn't no, be. No, I'll explain so, so it. So say what that is. The first victims of the Holocaust were not Jews. They were German infants and young children under the age of three who were disabled in some way. Doctors drew up protocols how to medically murder the children. There were 22 wards in hospitals and clinics that whose purpose was to murder the children. This is the mid 30s. Yes, 39. Okay, late 30s. 39. The program was rather secretive except that everybody in health, in medicine and public health knew about it because they were given uh forms to fill for every child. And it was doctors, medical doctors who selected each child deciding whether death was due. Uh, the children were murdered slowly, starved, and barbiturates, but they wanted it to look natural. You're making a parallel when Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo, the governor, sent old uh, people yes. uh, to nursing homes and then sent people afflicted with COVID into the nursing homes. You're saying it was intentional. They knew that yes. they are, to use a nice term, culling the weakest elderly out. Why? Why would they do that? 
Okay, going back to the Nazi part, after the young children, it was children of all ages with any disability, and then was the mentally ill, and finally the nursing home residents. Now, you ask the purpose. They had sort of three purposes. One was to cleanse the genetic pool. Remember, That's we're, the, we're, we're talking in the eugenics. About, we're, we're talking about the Nazis. Yes. Yeah. If you're unfit, they wanted to kill off That's anybody true. passing on genes they don't like. So we'll, we'll murder them. Yeah. The second reason was to eliminate the economic burden of worthless eaters. Yeah. The economic burden of nursing homes is equal. What launched you into medical activism and into all that you're now doing was the death of your teenage son. It's before he died. Um, I became active during his illness. <clears throat> and I received a, an article from the American Journal of Psychiatry, which was about an L-DOPA experiment on 28 veterans at the Bronx VA. And when I read the article, I couldn't believe it because I said, this is Nazi medicine. The, the article described how doctors took in these 28 veterans who had been living in the community. They were already, they were, were healthy at that point, but they had had schizophrenia and they were on various treatments. They took them off all their treatments, gave them L-DOPA, and sent them to the community to see how long it would take each one to have a psychotic relapse. I don't know what L-DOPA is, except the dope. L-DOPA is, okay, it's a drug, it's used uh, for, in animal uh, anesthetics, but it has the potential to cause psychosis. Why would they do that? Exactly. I sent the article to two psychiatrists that I knew, and I said, am I reading this right? And they said, yes. So that's how I began. I filed a complaint with the Federal Office of Human Research Protection. It took them four years to investigate and to corroborate that, yeah. But of course, nobody went on trial. And four of those veterans became violent during the psychotic relapse. Well, now they had that on their record as well. Thank you to these doctors, academic doctors, the, and this was paid for by the National Institute of Mental Health. So that, that's how I began to delve into what else are they doing there? Uh, so you, you, you studied art history, you studied library science, yeah. and then you get, as a mother, launched into this world. Yeah. And so this was the 70s? It was, uh, well, later and I, I went into you know in the 90s I mean it's been I've been doing well you've this been doing for this for, for decades but yeah, I'm saying you got yeah. launched on it because of what your son yes. suffered oh yeah it was because of him well I had to learn what to you know how to get service and all that and I realized that this was a, a pit it was just terrible and again a lot of money is going into for bad bad treatment bad house bad everything we have a few minutes left today. Let's, let me just ask you, you talk about parallels between what was happening back then and today. I know you spoke a bit this on Truth Over Fear with Patrick Coffin. What is your nutshell version of that? That if you suspend your right to make decisions for yourself, your personal decisions, and what could be more personal than your body, and once you go along with deferring to authority, you're in big trouble because they do not have your best interest in mind. They can do a lot of harm, and they do. Much more harm has been done by public health than by any number of doctors. A doctor may be incompetent, may make mistakes, but how many people will they harm? Very few. But public health, with one swoop policy, you can kill hundreds of thousands. So no, you shouldn't trust. That's the worst thing. I mean, I know I'm in good company. Einstein said the foolish <laughs> person who trusts authority, you know, won't get at the truth.